um, I wanted to uh, to come talk with all of you about uh, immutability and why I find uh, immutability to be such an important um, uh, feature of uh, an architecture. Uh, so important that I put down all my thoughts in this book, The Art of Immutable Architecture. You can find out more about it at immutablearchitecture.com. And uh, if you want to follow along today with the uh, the source code, you can find that on GitHub, GitHub slash Michael L. Perry slash Festify. You can go ahead and uh, uh, fork that repo, clone it, pull it down, uh, make some changes. If you find something in there that, uh, that you think would be an improvement, send me a PR. I'd love to uh, continue the conversation with that. Um, and uh, and so this is a um, an example application that I uh, that I worked up for um, a Pluralsight course. So I uh, I teach courses on Pluralsight, and uh, um, I do consulting for a uh, a group here in Dallas uh, called um, uh, called Improving. Uh, looking at another IM word right here on my screen, and that uh, escaped me for some reason. But uh, but yeah, please reach out to me and let's talk about immutability. So. Why is immutability such an important feature uh, for understanding um, applications, uh, especially distributed systems? And it's because it gives us a lot of, uh, of capabilities that uh, are hard to achieve otherwise. It gives us auditability. We can look at the data structure and see exactly what happened in the past. Um, it gives us reliability. We have information about what different nodes know about, and they can... Um, uh, they can exchange that information in a very reliable way. Uh, it helps us to achieve consistency so that uh, we know that um, after all the information has gone from one node to another, uh, everybody is talking about the same thing. And overall, it's really just a lot easier to reason about. So you've probably heard this in, re uh, in respect to functional programming languages. Um, we're building languages on top of uh, runtimes that don't allow mutation of data structures, but instead you build new data structures and uh, those are immutable over their lifetime. Uh, a lot easier to reason about. Um, I'm basically taking that idea and extending it out to the database, out across the network throughout the entire application. And all of this boils down to really just one thing, that every copy of an immutable object is just as good as any other copy. So if you think about caching, hey, is my cache up to date? Yes, because that's an immutable object. It's just as good as any other copy. Oh, I've, I've got a replica of my database. Is that replica uh, in sync? Yes, because all of the objects in that database are immutable. They're not going to change. Um, you maybe don't know about some immutable objects uh, that are in the other replica, but as soon as you learn about them, you're consistent. So this uh, this idea of immutability just really helps us to guarantee that um, that every copy of an object, no matter where it is, is going to be the exact same copy. And that is going to help us to solve a lot of technical problems. And we're going to dive into some real code and uh, and see um, what those solutions are. Before we do, I want to kind of talk about our default, though. So. Um, when we build things using ASP.NET, uh, building SQL Server, building a NoSQL database, we, um, we default to mutability. So um, this default, I think, comes from two different areas. It comes from the technology itself, and it comes from the problems that we're trying to solve. So if we take a look at the technology side, um, technology originally um, that, that we build upon originally came from a math paper by this brilliant guy named Alan Turing. And he defined Turing machines, which are an infinite tape that, uh, that has a, uh, a playhead that kind of moves around the tape and rewrites a symbol at each of the different uh, places on that tape. So Turing machines are all about mutating those symbols as the state evolves. That's how they were defined. Um, we have technologies uh, built into our languages. Um, uh, Object-oriented programming languages have uh, properties that you can set. Um, you know, just about any procedural language has variables that you can assign to, and you can change those values. So we're used to thinking about those things. Um, databases, they have update statements, they have delete statements. Um, they don't just have insert and select. So they support mutation of the data. And it really kind of boils down to the fact that 
machines are limited in uh, memory and in storage. And so we end up having to reuse those things. Now on the problem side of, of the house, we look around and we see that the world is made of things that change. So um, people will change their names, phone numbers, email addresses, they'll change all sorts of properties about themselves. They'll change properties about the, uh, the things that they, uh, that they own. You know, the, uh, you know, they'll change the car that they drive. They'll, um, you know, they'll, they'll, you know, even, uh, uh, you know, change jobs and, and, you know, change big things about, uh, about their lives. And we're modeling these changing worlds. Um, when we log on to our bank, uh, we want to get the answer to the question, how much money is in the bank? Can I pay this bill? Can I go out to dinner? And, um, and so the question that we're asking is one about something that changes an account balance. And that's the thing that we want to see. And, uh, and yes, of course, the, uh, the doctor, uh, he, is, he is always changing what time it is and what year it is and what, uh, what galaxy he happens to be a part of. And he's changing history all the time. It's you know, any, any causal uh, you know, temporal uh, anomalies. You definitely have, have to talk to the doctor about that. So you bring these things together and now you've got um, a changing problem domain and you're trying to model that using technology that's built on change, of course the default is going to be to build those solutions using mutability. I mean, that's why object-oriented programming languages are the, uh, are the norm. They're, they're really common. And that's why um, you know, uh, functional programming languages that, that favor um, immutability, uh, they tend to be kind of you know, thought about and relegated to, oh, that's the, uh, the, the mathsy folks over there doing that kind of thing because they want to prove theorems about their code and all that stuff. Um, and, and of course, we're like, yes, yes, we do. And I think we, that you do too. So maybe, um, maybe we can take a look at uh, immutability as a way to solve problems, to model a problem domain uh, that mutates and implement that immutability on top of mutable technology. I mean, this goes all the way back to the beginning. I talked about Turing machines. At the same time, Alonzo Church wrote a paper solving the exactly the same math problem. He solved it in a different way where he came up with Lambda Calculus. Hey, that's the foundation for functional programming languages. And Lambda Calculus is all about um, producing a brand new expression based on an existing one. So not changing the expression at all, but still evolving state over time. So this is what we're going to try to accomplish. We're going to try to simulate a mutating domain in a mutating computer, but we're going to do it with an immutable model. So let's start by taking a look at where we are and let's see where we're going to go with this. If I were to create a brand new project in uh, in ASP.NET, uh, just give me a brand new application, I would end up with something a lot like this. So this is a, uh, an application that uh, I uh, really quick just added an entity framework entity, and we can keep track of meetings. So we're going to have a user group meeting. Um, let's go back to you know, one of my old favorite talks, you know, how not to destroy data. And let's go ahead and schedule that and uh, create that. Okay, now we've got that talk on the list. And if we take a look at the database underlying that talk, here we are with our user group meetings. Go ahead and select from that table. And there it is, how not to destroy data. If I come in here, edits, then any change that I make is reflected in that database. So we're, we're mutating the, the problem domain. You can edit, uh, you can delete, and um, we're reflecting that in, in a mutable database. So you're, you're updating the database. Now, what are some of the problems that could occur because I am using mutation for my application. Well, if I take a look at my um, my uh, 
controller here, I've got a controller action create. So I'm going to call this anytime I do an HTTP post to the um, user group meeting slash create URL. And that's going to save some changes to the database. Um, this is working just fine in localhost. But what if this were across the network? What if things took a little bit of time? What if things could possibly fail? Let's go ahead and put a five second delay after we have uh, saved our new meeting. And so I'm going to go ahead and create a, a new meeting. This is one we'll call go, don't click submit twice. Let's go ahead and schedule that one. And I'll open up the, uh, the network tab so we can see everything that's going on here. All right, I'm going to hit create. Hmm, things don't seem to be working. Okay, let me try that again. You know, I think this site might be broken. If I click this button a few more times, I might be able to fix it. So the uh, the people who made this site will thank me for that. There we go. Ah, oh, darn, what just happened? Oh my goodness, I just created a whole bunch of duplicate records. I mean, if I take a look at what happened, there's only one of them that actually got through. Here's the create with my uh, 302 doing the, during the redirect back to the page. Uh, that's the only one that succeeded. Everything else was canceled. So if it was canceled, why did it have an effect? Well, that's because it was just canceled in the browser. The, uh, um, yeah, the browser is, uh, is done with it. But uh, that request already made it to the server. The server had already done some work on it. It was just on the way back that, uh, that things failed. So. Default, out of the box, we get this kind of behavior where we can create these, uh, uh, these duplicates uh, 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 records. And that's all based on the fact that create is going to this URL, user group meetings slash create. Um, here's a quick question for you. Go ahead and type your answer in the comments. Uh, if we take a look at the details here, we'll see that this is user group meetings slash details slash 24. Where did that 24 come from? I'll click on another one here. This one was 18. So what generated that ID and um, when was it generated? So go ahead and type your answers in the, uh, in the chat window. And I'm seeing generated on the, in the database on save. It's the primary key, auto increment ID. Excellent. That is precisely what's happening here. So if we take a look, we're using this auto incrementing ID as the ID of the record. And what if I told you that that's part of the problem? Let's see what a different solution to this problem might be. So here, I'm, uh, let's go back to, well, I'll, I'll go back to that. This one is a, uh, um, a, a different application, um, also ASP.NET, also based on Entity Framework. Um, uh, this one, though, I adopted a few different patterns. Um, so in this application, we can keep track of venues. So I've got a couple of venues in there. Um, and the acts that are going to play at those venues. So let me go ahead and create an act. And I will create a, an act. Uh, Jeff Foxworthy. So there's Jeff Foxworthy right there. Create, and there he goes. He's, uh, he's in the database. So what would happen if I deployed this application to production? So let me go to my X controller. All right, and so here is my create. So I'm posting to slash create. And so what if after I save the act, I go ahead and have my five second delay? Well, what's going to happen here? So let's go back to acts. We are going to create a new act. So this will be Gabriel Iglesias. Fluffy. 
All right, let's go ahead and open up the uh, the network tab and see what happens when I say create. Mm, taking too long. Try again. Create. You know what? This this site is broken too. What is wrong with these people? Don't they know how to build scalable apps? But there it is. Okay, we finally got uh, Fluffy in the database. And look, just one. We didn't get a whole bunch of duplicates. So how did we accomplish that? How did we make it such that our, um, uh, our application was able to receive these duplicate requests, but still only generate, generate one response? Um, we got good new GUID in there. Awesome, yes. Unique ID using the title, great guess. Um, that is a, uh, uh, actually something that we're gonna be talking about. ID created on the client. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Now let me show you the secret sauce right here is when we navigate to X slash create, then that GUID is going to come in as null. And so if it's a null, let's do a redirect back to create, but this time let's set the GUID. So what does that look like? So here I am, when I hit create X, I can see I'm going to slash X slash create, but then uh, let me go ahead and clear this out so you can see precisely what happens. But then I immediately get a redirect to um, da, 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 x slash create slash, and then this brand new good, and there it is. So yes, we have generated a brand new good, and we've given that back to the client before we've touched the database at all. That is the key to uh, to making this work. And now that we're there, when we um, post to slash x slash create, and um, that actually should have the, uh, the good in there as well. And that's what we're really posting to. And then we get our good back and uh, we use that as the ID for the object. So that is um, precisely how we are going to solve this problem of tolerating multiple um, requests, but only giving you one uh, response, one change. There's a mathematical name for this property. Does anyone happen to know what that name is? And I will give you a hint. Um, you can see this is an HTTP post. Um, post is typically uh, not usually guaranteed to have this property. Uh, this one's also using an HTTP post. That's the idempotent property. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Yes, the idempotent property says that um, if you um, if you take uh, multiple copies of a, of, a, uh, of a request, you will behave as if you had only received one copy of that request. Um, uh, mathematically speaking, it's a, it's got an even more succinct uh, definition. Um, you could say if you, if you, if your operator was hat. Um, so whatever operator you're performing on an object, a hat a equals a. So seeing the thing twice is as if you had seen it once, has the same effect, has the same outcome. So that is how we are going to change the world and change the way that we're thinking about building our applications so that we can achieve things like uh, idempotency, even on things like post, which are not ordinarily guaranteed to be idempotent. So to kind of cover um, everything that we're gonna go through within this, uh, this application in order to achieve some of these benefits, um, we're gonna be talking about alternate keys. Um, that is that uh, every table in the database has a key in addition to its uh, auto incrementing ID. Uh, we're gonna be talking about snapshots, uh, how we're keeping track of different versions of an object over time. Tombstones. How do you delete? Uh, content addressable storage. This is really awesome for dealing with those large uh, resources. And commutative messages. So we talked about item potency, a hat a equals a. Commutative means a hat b is equal to b hat a. We can uh, swap the order. So is it worth considering the size of your primary key? It absolutely is. Um, so we are going to dive into the database and uh, and talk about primary key, alternate key, and how um, yeah, how the database is going to respond to various sizes. 
So do you recommend redirect from create to create good, or can you put the create good URL behind the button directly? Uh, that is a really great distinction. So let's dive into that before we get too far into this. So I demonstrated um, that uh, create act does a, a redirect, but you could have generated the good and have that right here uh, behind this create act link. The reason that I didn't do that on this application is because um, somebody might create something and then hit the back button. And now the browser just gives them back the same thing that they, uh, they saw before, um, assuming that my, um, my caching policy allows the browser to do that, in which case now this create uh, act button has the same GUID as before. So um, by doing the redirect, that guarantees that, um, that uh, the, the browser has taken some deliberate action to go to, to follow that button and then is generated a brand new GUID. And so while this page can be cached just according to the content, the, um, the page that you navigate to that does the redirect, that one can't be cached and it has to go all the way to the, uh, to the server. So good question. All right, so let's get things kicked off with alternate keys. So with alternate keys, we want to hide the auto-incremented ID. And we already saw a little bit about uh, that we were doing that by uh, using this GUID instead of the ID. So this is what the database looks like for, um, for this particular application. So we've got our ACT table. And uh, so we've got our ACT ID. That is the primary key. And it's an integer. And yes, it is an auto-incrementing integer. And then in addition, we have an ACT GUID. That's a unique identifier, a, a GUID. Um, and that has a uniqueness constraint on that table or on that uh, column. So that means there can't be any other act that has that same good. And, uh, and it also means that it's indexed so I can very easily, uh, very quickly find an act by its good. And so this um, is sometimes called an alternate key. And in fact, in, um, in Entity Framework, you would declare this by saying has alternate key. And, uh, and so that is the, uh, the key that we use everywhere outside of the database. Now, inside the database, we are still using that primary key, that integer act ID. And we're using that as a foreign key. So um, uh, the act has a child table act uh, description. Uh, venue has a child table venue description. Uh, you'll notice that act and venue don't have any of the other stuff that you might expect, like the, uh, you know, the name of the act, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the picture, the image. Um, all of that stuff goes inside of act description and venue description. And so those tables also have uh, an alternate key. And uh, that alternate key is the foreign key, the act ID that it's uh, referring to, and the modified date. So those two things taken together are the alternate key of the act description, which means that over time, we can evolve an act by having more and more descriptions over time. And um, every time we create a new one, we can identify it by the act ID and the modified date. So this pattern uh, also continues with shows. So a show is a, an act appearing at a venue. Let me go ahead and show you shows within the application real quick. So uh, Gabriela Iglesias is going to play at American Airlines Center. Um, so yeah, let's have them coming here next month. And so we will create that. And so now we have just created a show for Gabriela Iglesias. And as I did so right here, I did a post to shows create, and then here is the good for the act. So that's the same good as we see up here for the act, but then the body of that creation, uh, the, uh, the form data contains the venues good and the start time of the show. So those three things taken together are the alternate key for the show. And again, just like when I created an act, the client knew that ahead of time. Here, when you're scheduling a show, these are three things that the client knows ahead of time. And so posting that 
gets to be an idempotent operation. So we're using that same alternate key pattern for relationships. Um, and then uh, we, we basically take that entire pattern and we um, spread that through the entire database. So in this database, every one of these tables that you see here has an alternate key. And each one of these is an insert only table. Uh, they are the, the rows within the, those tables are immutable. You never update, you never delete. So you take a look at this, that's a lot of tables. If I were to build this in a typical, um, you know, out of the box, uh, update, delete kind of a, uh, 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 an application, I would end up with three tables. I would have act, show, and venue. Just these three right here. And all of these properties would be shoved up into the act and the venue tables. And then in order to remove uh, and to cancel the show, you would just delete those, uh, those rows. But here, I've uh, taken the, uh, the deliberate decision that everything is immutable, and I've broken that down into lots of little tables. And every single one of them has an alternate key. Now, there is one exception in here that we're going to dive into in a little bit. Um, this table does not have an alternate key, and that's because it doesn't have an auto-incremented ID. It just uses a hash as the primary key. So we're going to be talking a bit more about um, uh, how this table operates and, and what problems it solves when we talk about content address storage. But I do want to use this as an opportunity to dive into one of the, uh, the questions. So question, uh, would it be easier to have an event store? Absolutely. Uh, if uh, event store is a, uh, a product that you are comfortable with, then uh, have at it. Uh, the, Patterns that I'm showing here are um, taking advantage of the tools that are probably already in your tool belt, tool belt and how you can use immutability within those tools. But yes, event sourcing is another example of an immutable architecture. Good call out. Uh, so why not just use the GUIDs for the primary keys and the foreign keys? That is exactly the, um, the question I wanna dive into here. So um, GUIDs tend to uh, look random. Um, there is a way that you can generate goods that are um, monotonically increasing, uh, but that is not the way that we will typically do them. Um, and in fact, if you've got goods that are coming from lots of different places, then they're not gonna be monotonically increasing everywhere. So the uh, um, you know, kind of the, the default assumption is when a good hits your system, it's going to look pretty random. And so if you want to insert a, um, a record and you have that GUID used as the primary key, that means that uh, it's also used as the clustered index, at least in SQL Server. And so that means that your, um, the, your data on the pages on disk, um, that data is organized uh, according to the, uh, um, the clustered index. And so in order to take this new GUID that you've seen and put it into an existing page of data, um, most of the time it's going to be somewhere in the middle and you're going to have to copy everything below it and make a new page that's called page splitting. And then you can insert that new row at the bottom of the first page. So this leads to a lot of fragmentation within the data structure on disk. Um, so SSD, maybe not so bad, but, uh, but you still have data structures that, uh, um, that are working uh, even in a, uh, a solid state disk. And, um, and those data structures um, really perform a lot better when you are only inserting to the, uh, the bottom of the table. So you're only appending to the existing page. So um, using an auto-incremented ID as the clustered index, as the primary key, uh, helps to keep the, uh, the database nice and, uh, nice and happy. Using it as a foreign key means that you are indexing over that 64-bit uh, integer as opposed to creating an index over 128-bit GUID. So, um, so your indexes get to be smaller and they get to be a bit more well-behaved as well. So, um, so when dealing with, the, with an internal data structure, I do like to use that, uh, that auto-incremented ID. It's just, I'd never want that to leave the database. So that is the, um, the reason for that uh, with respect to goods. Here, hash, same thing applies. When you hash a document, you're gonna get essentially a random number. 
Um, and so you're going to get page splitting on this table as well. So that is uh, something that you want to keep in mind if you decide to use this pattern. And honestly, um, if you were <clears throat> using content address storage, storing things by their hash, then I would say you probably don't want to do that in a SQL database. This is just uh, to make it easy for you to clone the repo, get things started, and start playing around with the app. But use a content delivery network or something like that uh, that does yeah, a, a short name or a short key to a, a large uh, object and uh, have that cached within your CDN. So let's take a quick look at the um, at what the application is doing in order to make all this happen. So, so we saw how the ID is coming in from the client. So the server doesn't generate the ID in response to creation. That comes from the client. The client already knows what the ID is going to be. And then we get in here into save act. And we immediately apply this next little pattern called get or insert. So it's going to get or insert by this act good that we just received from the client, which means that it is first going to get. It's going to see, do I have something in my database that has that particular act good? And if so, then I'll return that uh, that single act. I can use single here because I know that this is enforced by the database that um, there won't be any duplicate uh, records with that same good. So I get single or default. So if it comes back null, I know I don't have it yet. I go ahead and add that act, insert it into the database, and I'm on my way. But uh, if it already is in the database, I'm not going to insert it. I'm just going to return it. So the only thing that's in this act is that good and the primary key that's generated by the, by the database. Here's a couple of navigation properties that uh, we're going to be talking about in just a second. So, um, so all that, uh, that this is trying to do is get that good into the database and then essentially give me back the ID that it eventually maps to. And that's the select or insert pattern. There it is. Uh, the get or insert. So would you never return the int uh, in any SQL query that populates DTOs to be used by your app? Um, and that is exactly uh, the case. Yes, I would never return the primary key from any API that touches uh, that database. And the reason for that is, uh, is it goes even deeper than this item potency uh, problem that we're trying to solve here. The reason is what I like to call location independence. The, the ID that this particular database assigns to this, uh, to this object is only meaningful to that database. If we had a replica database and we tried to insert the same object into that database, it might come up with a different ID for it. We're still, it might come up with the same ID for a different object. So. Um, so those IDs can't really be moved very easily from one database to another. And so I like to use an identifier that is not dependent upon the location, not dependent upon which replica of the database you're hitting, uh, but instead a, uh, a location independent identifier like the GUID. So if you were building a mobile application and you wanted to act upon that mobile application, uh, save something to your local database uh, on that app and then have it queue up a message to go to the server sometime later, then that mobile application has already come up with an identity, a GUID, and it probably inserted it into a new database uh, row on that local device, which has a completely different ID than the one that the server will eventually come up with. So using those location independent identifiers helps you to, um, to distribute your application across multiple data stores. Yeah, so is there a race condition in get or add? Uh, would you need to, to um, uh, mutex it in order to do this in production? Excellent question. Um, I don't know that I can click fast enough to demonstrate the race condition. Um, actually, I could, I could put in the uh, delay. Anyway, we'll just talk through the race condition. Yes, um, so if I, um, uh, if I get two threads that are in here at the same time and they have both um, gotten the uh, run this query and they find there is no record in the database. They're both going to try to insert it at the same time. 
And so ordinarily you would think, okay, that's going to create two different records with the same GUID. But because I have explicitly told SQL that this is a, um, a uniqueness constraint, that this is an alternate key, then SQL will prevent me from doing that. Um, so let me show the act um, that this is inside of data, the promotion context. Uh, oh, which is the class I'm already in, yes. Um, so if I take a look at on model creating, so this is how I have declared the act entity. It has alternate key act good. So you'll see that every single one of these has an alternate key. And so that's going to instruct SQL to create an index on those columns and then enforce uniqueness. And so, um, so yeah, absolutely. If, uh, if two threads get in there and they both try to insert at the same time, one of them is going to throw an exception. So uh, really in order to make this, let me, let me get back to, no, you wait. Okay, there we go. Uh, so um, really in order to make this um, good production quality code, uh, we would want to put a retry around get or insert. So, um, so if it tries to insert, throws an exception, okay, go back around to the top and, uh, and try to get that entity that uh, you just inserted. So do the get or inserts act as a single SQL statement? They do not. Um, in fact, I'm not even putting these inside of a transaction. So this um, is a select statement that's going to return zero rows. And then this is an insert statement. Um, it's just that uh, SQL is going to enforce the uh, uniqueness constraint on that insert statement. So, um, so yeah, you are correct. Any framework cannot turn this into a single uh, insert statement. Um, there is a there is a trick if you're writing SQL yourself. Um, it's uh, it's a little bit deep. Yeah, insert where? Um, yeah, okay, that's the easier way to go about it. I was thinking about there's an even more complicated way, but yeah, insert where? Do that one. Um, that uh, basically will will perform these two operations at the same time. Um, you could also put these in a, in a transaction, and that way, uh, when you go from the select to the insert, it's going to try to elevate the, uh, the lock, but basically that turns your uniqueness constraint violation into a deadlock. Uh, so uh, you still end up with a, uh, an exception that you have to retry. At any rate, let me go ahead and kill that um, so that uh, whatever is happening to Visual Studio at the moment is, is able to clear itself out. And in the meantime, let's summarize what we were just talking about here is that in order to use alternate keys, uh, you want to uh, include foreign keys within the alternate keys of child tables, uh, perform a select or insert um, pattern in order to see if the record is there, if not insert it, uh, you never share that public key outside of the database itself, so it's not exposed as part of the API. And the uh, the client produces and stores those identifiers. Or in this case, we saw that it's posting to the server, the server's redirecting and giving it the identifier. That's just because JavaScript may be not so good at, uh, at generating goods. But uh, um, but otherwise, just in uh, in general, it's the um, the the client's application's responsibility to um, come up with those identifiers. Awesome. So our next pattern is snapshots. So this is how we're going to get around the fact that we have made an architectural decision to disallow updates. You're no longer going to update any records in the database. So instead, um, uh, you are going to have to insert something. So what we're going to do is we're going to insert a snapshot. Let me show, and because I killed uh, Visual Studio, I probably killed the uh, application too. So let me get that started again. And go back to our acts. And so I'm going to edit 
Gabriel Iglesias, and change the uh, the title. Okay, so now I have mutated my act. I've made a change. Well, I haven't really mutated anything. I have just inserted something into the database. Let's see what it is that we have inserted. So here is our um, our database up here. We've got act descriptions. So select from act descriptions. And we can see that we've got a uh, uh, an act ID, a modified date, and the uh, the title. Um, we also are capturing the image hash. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but you can see these two right here are two different snapshots, two different versions of the data uh, related to um, the same act. So there are two different act description IDs, but it's the act ID and the modified date taken together. These two are the alternate key for that table. And so um, I can look up by um, by act ID. This is how state has evolved over time for this particular entity. And then using the modified date, I can tell which is the current one. So I can tell, OK, Fluffy Live is the one that I need to display. So if I come back a second from this guy, um, let's, let's just talk about the queries for a second. So here's the act queries. So here's how we're going to display our list of acts. So starting with our acts, um, we're going to select our new um, re uh, results with the act good and then the description. So the description is coming from this navigation property of all the descriptions for this act. So joined by that foreign key, then order by descending modified date and get the first or default. So that means just give me the most recent description for this act. Um, it could come back as null if I haven't uh, given this act a description yet, um, or it'll come back with just one description record. And then here, I'm just mapping that into a JSON data structure. Um, so that is uh, is how I am looking up the current description of an act. And you might be wondering, what does that look like when it's converted into SQL? Oh my goodness, what is that? That's terrible stuff. Why would you ever throw that at a database? That's crazy. Well, let's uh, let's go ahead and take this apart real quick. Um, so if you focus on the row number part, so let's look at the query that that lives in. We're selecting from act descriptions, uh, and we're getting the modified date, act ID, and title, and one more column, a row number. So this is going to be partitioned by the act ID. So every time act ID changes as we're scanning that, uh, that table, uh, it's going to start back over at one. And then it's going to be ordered by modified date descending. So we're going to number the most recent one, row number one, the second most recent one is going to be row number two. The third most recent is row number three. And then, oh, new act. OK, that starts over at row number one again. And so when we do that, uh, um, that subselect here, we get just those with row number one. So for some reason, it just uh, it generates less than or equal to one, but row number always starts at one. So um, that gives us row number one. That gives us the most recent uh, act description. And then we left join that in so that we can do our uh, um, first or default, and uh, that gives us the uh, the act that we're looking at. So um, I did say that as it's scanning your table, it's going to start back over at one every time you see act ID one. And yes, I did mean scan. That's the default that you're going to get if you just try to run this query out of the box. You're going to get a table scan. But table scans are not the way that you want your application to work. You want them to be able to use an index. And so every time you, you uh, use this pattern, you will also want to create an index. And you want that index to start with this information right here. So you index by act ID increasing, and then modified date decreasing. And that way, it's able to just index scan. So uh, even though the word scan is in there, it's actually a much faster operation. It's able to um, go into that uh, that index and find the first record with that act ID. 
if it was a unique index or a unique record, that would be a, an index seek. But uh, this is still getting a range of, uh, of records. But they're all the, uh, the records, the entire history for a particular act. Um, and then uh, if you also include into that index the modified date, the, uh, the act ID is already there, and the title, or oh, the modified date's already there too. You, you include all of these uh, extra columns that are not already part of the index. Then after it does that index scan, it's able to complete that operation from the index itself, and it doesn't have to go back to the main table. So once you've done that, um, you take a look at the, uh, um, the query plan, measure your performance, you'll find it's much improved. Still not as fast as just get me the most recent version from the database as it currently is, but um, it's, uh, uh, it's usually fast enough for the, uh, um, the types of, uh, of applications that we, um, that we build every day. If you find that it's not quite enough, then you go the, uh, the next uh, step, create a, um, a projection from, uh, from the immutable tables into the current state, and then you can select against that all day long and, and have a, a really fast uh, operation. If you're already in SQL to do that, um, then you can use something like triggers in order to um, to queue up a uh, um, uh, an operation, a, a store procedure. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the there's a there's a um, a service in SQL Server. It's been built into it for a long time. Uh, that uh, that basically acts as a, um, a an indexer that you can uh, really control. So every time you insert into this table queue something up that's going to run this query and then update a, uh, a projection table. Um, but measure first. Most of the time, this is going to be just fine. So can we guarantee that the alternate key with the modified date is unique? What happens if two changes uh, come in where the data ends up the same? Does one of them throw? CDC, yes, that's it. Uh, CDC is the, um, the, the service that's built into SQL Server. Uh, uh, I forget what it stands for now, but if you Google that, um, uh, you will you will find the change data capture. That's it. Yeah, that is the thing. Um, and of course, we had the question earlier about event store. So if you've got something that you're storing outside of SQL Server, um, basically you're you're capturing a, a snapshot, um, a uh, uh, what's that called? A persistent view model uh, from uh, from your history, and then you can query directly against that. So, yep, all these options, but immutability is what makes it possible. So, um, what if you have some kind of a conflict? So, let's suppose that here we are. We have two people who want to edit the uh, the Jeff Foxworthy uh, show. So, let's go into or the act. So, let's go into the details here, and uh, then somebody else is going to go into the details on their machine. So, so now we've got two people looking at the same record at the same time. So one person is going to edit, another person is going to edit. And uh, yeah, redneck. And we're going to save that. OK, that is the new name of that act. In the meantime, yeah, this is going to be the uh, blue collar comedy tour. And I'm going to hit save. What do you think is going to happen? Boom, throw an exception. Now, a real application would catch this exception, present something nice to the user. But, uh, but I wanted you to see what was happening here, is that we got a DB update concurrency exception that, uh, that two um, actors are trying to update the same record at the same time. So that's an exception that Entity Framework will, um, if you if you configure it, you turn that on, it will do that automatically for you whenever you try to uh, write an update statement. But we're not doing update statements. So how did we get that? So if we take a look at our Festify application, and let's go back to our act commands. So here we are, we're going to save an act. And we're going to call save act, whether it's uh, that we're creating one or we are updating one. So first, we're going to do our getter insert. We've got our good. Now we've got an act entity itself. 
then we're going to get the, um, the most recent description. So order by descending modified date first or default, this is the most recent act description. The first thing we're do gonna do is check to see is what we're trying to save different from that. If it's the same, hey, stop, no need to save. But if the data is different, then we check the modified date. If the modified date that we just saw in the database is in any way different from the modified date that's coming in from the request, the last modified date, the last one that it saw when it opened its uh, browser tab, then we throw our DB update concurrency exception. So, um, so we are protecting against um, those uh, um, concurrent updates within, um, within our business logic here. So the, um, uh, this solution depends upon there being a database to go to. This depends upon um, a particular piece of topology. Now, if you happen to be working in a, an architecture that doesn't, doesn't have that particular topology, then this might not work for you. For example, let's suppose you've got a replica of the database. So people you know, on, uh, <clears throat> uh, in Europe are, are inserting into this one, people in North America are inserting into that one. And periodically they're going to share tables or they're gonna share rows with one another. Um, and so you've done this concurrency check and said, okay, I loaded something and I saved it. I loaded the same thing and I saved a different, different version. They both saved without knowledge of the other one because they haven't done their, their sync yet. Um, when they do sync, <clears throat> there's nothing in that data that tells them that there was a uh, concurrent change. So if you want to support something that has m a more distributed uh, architecture, then this pattern is not gonna be quite enough. You'll want to go to the next level. Fortunately, oh, here it is. Somebody wrote a book and it's got that pattern in it. It's called the mutable property pattern. And it looks like this. So. Check that out. Um, that is how you can detect concurrent edits and you can resolve those uh, even in a fully distributed system. But this is a good start. This will get you going. Um, so should we not allow concurrent updates and always be happy with the latest? And then the client could do a read uh, after write in order to check that it was successful. <clears throat> Um, that is uh, that is another option for you. Um, <clears throat> what you'll want to do is know what uh, what option you're choosing. Know what um, trade-offs you're making. In <clears throat> in the case of read after writes, um, another write might have come in after your write, and then you read that. Um, how do you know that that other write was more recent than your own? So <clears throat> it's uh, um, it's it's a little bit tricky to. Uh, to try to solve this kind of a problem using the, um, the topology itself. Um, I often say uh, you're trying to solve a concurrency problem using topology. If you, um, if you rely on something that is just completely based on immutability, then um, you can solve the problem without taking topology into account at all. But you lose a few things. Um, so. If, uh, for example, you have uh, an application that, uh, you know, say you've, you're supporting a disconnected mobile application. So you're making your updates on your mobile device and you're eventually going to send those up to the server. So you want to capture those updates in such a way that uh, they're immutable and identifiable on this device. They're location independent. And then somebody else can make um, their updates, their, their changes, their snapshots on a different uh, device send those to the, uh, the server. And it doesn't matter the order in which things flow or if you talk directly peer to peer or you go through one server or many servers, however th that information gets to you, um, you want to be able to detect that there has been a concurrent change, which sounds kind of difficult until you think about Git. This is a problem that you already solve every time you write code. You work on a branch and you create your commits, your commits are related to the parent commits, the things that you started from. If somebody else is making their changes and making commits based on the same parent, then when they push and you pull and, and you share, you 
pull request, whatever you need to do in order to get those commits over here and your commits over there, both of you can see that this graph has two leaves, that there has been a concurrent change. And that's really what you're, what you're striving for. So using a modified date and getting the most recent one is not solving that problem, but it's a start. Um, to really solve that problem, that's where you want to use the mutable property pattern that's in the book. And that is uh, really honoring the fact that you've got these concurrent changes and they persist. And then everybody can see that there's concurrent changes. Okay, we've got a great question about GDPR. Um, oh, but first uh, let me scroll back, make sure. All right, so um, in past versions uh, of all data, if past versions of all data is in the database, how would you deal with requests to delete certain older versions like uh, you know, GDPR requests to be forgotten? So yes, that is definitely a concern that, uh, that uh, you need to consider. Um, and so when I build my databases, like uh, this one here, um, I always make sure that I have the um, cascade delete turned on. So if I want to delete all the information about a particular act, say, and then the act says, you know what, I, want, I don't want you promoting my act anymore, I want to be forgotten. I can just delete that uh, that record and then everything cascades down to the successors, the, uh, the things that followed. Now that doesn't affect records for other acts. Um, it doesn't affect your venues, but it does clean up all of the shows related to that act. Um, so that still is a, a possibility with, uh, um, with this type of uh, situation. Um, if you go one step further and you have um, all of this in an immutable graph that's not in a relational database, but you have, um, you've secured that information cryptographically, then you can just organize your cryptography such that um, all of the information about a particular act or a particular person or whatever is using a key that, um, uh, that they control. So, um, so they can log in and, uh, and use their private key in order to digitally sign things and encrypt things for, uh, for other people. So then you can use something like cryptographic key sh uh, shredding. So the data, the data is already is still in your database, but you've destroyed that key. You can no longer decrypt it. And uh, that is, uh, you know, I haven't studied GDPR specifically to see if that is uh, um, an accepted way of uh, accomplishing that, but that's, uh, that's a pretty standard way of, of destroying information. Um, okay. So what do you do with the database updates or changes? Adding, deleting columns, properties. How does that work? That is an excellent question. Um, take a look at venue. So you'll see, okay, here is the, uh, the venue. We already um, looked at, uh, at that one. It's just got a couple of columns, venue ID, venue good. Um, then venue description, oops, here we go. That adds just a couple more columns. That adds uh, the name and the city. The venue location, that adds just a couple more columns here. That's a latitude and longitude. So this is the, the pattern that you end up getting into is that every time you add a feature, you add a table. You don't add columns to existing tables. Um, adding columns means that, uh, that you have to make those columns uh, nullable, even if that field is required. Or you have to give it a default, even if the existing data in your database uh, shouldn't all have that same default. Um, so you have to kind of pollute your data structure in order to get a new column into it. Um, but this way, you get to add a brand new table. And uh, the things that didn't have that feature turned on yet, they just don't have a record in that table yet. But as you uh, start to collect that data, now you're inserting those rows as well. Um, and so for the most part, evolving a, an immutable schema is done by addition, just like evolving immutable data is done by inserts. So, um, so you, in general, um, don't usually run up against that problem. But sometimes you do. Sometimes you find that uh, you've organized your immutable model in a way that, uh, that really doesn't make sense for the next thing you're trying to accomplish. And then refactoring is a, uh, a serious concern. Um, the, um, the, the best strategy that I've found for accomplishing that is, um, is 
to, well, the two really good competing strategies. One is to allow the old schema to exist and still persist the old data. That way you're purely immutable. You are not going to alter that data at all. Um, and then you have two different projections. So whenever you run a query, you query the old schema and you query the new schema and you union those together or somehow merge them together in your view model. Um, so that's that, that's the way that I typically approach it um, because those changes tend to happen somewhat less frequently. Uh, I've got one application right now where I'm just doing my my second version of that. So I've got um, I've got two old models. Um, but uh, the the other um, solution is to use topology. Is that uh, you have all of these systems out there in the world that are on version one. They all have to report their data back into a centralized node. Then that node knows how to map version one onto version two. It does that mapping and then pushes everything back out. That is a, a much more uh, coordination heavy solution to the problem. Um, and it's, it's a solution that I have recommended to, uh, you know, to some clients, especially clients where they had a mutable model with an audit log. So every time you update something, you also insert into your audit log. And every time you, you delete something, you also insert into the audit log. It's like, okay, I want you to move away from that to an immutable model, but that, that change has to happen in one central location so that everything funnels through it. Um, so that is a, a great question. All right, so what if it's not the whole entity or person who wants to be forgotten? If it's just one part of history, uh, yeah, then uh, your your model has to have some representation of that one part of history. So you might not be deleting the thing at the top of the uh, um, of the database. You might be deleting a, a child record, but then you still do the cascade delete from there. Um, basically, when you're using immutability and you're using foreign keys to represent these immutable relationships, um, everything about a particular part of your application is going to be directly or indirectly related via, via a foreign key. So deleting that is going to wipe out all the information about that uh, particular entity. Uh, all right, uh, the architecture seems to be more, more suited for NoSQL event store storage solutions. Uh, I would not disagree. I would say that um, uh, while uh, I use this, this kind of a, uh, uh, an architecture for the clients that uh, you know, uh, I need to you know, build an application. Like one of my clients was um, was in law enforcement, and so they were keeping track of case data. They had to have a, a really good handle on chain of custody, and uh, they had to know where this information came from. And so, um, and so I said, okay, an immutable database will give you all of that uh, information because we will never delete information. We'll never destroy it by updating or overriding it. Um, and they said, okay, let's do that. Uh, and we built it in SQL because um, we knew that we were gonna be turning that over for, um, for their own application developers to, uh, uh, to pick up and, and carry forward. And so this was using the tools that they were already familiar with. Now for my own personal projects, I do use an immutable runtime. Uh, the immutable runtime I happen to use is called Janaga. That's a, an open source project that I maintain. Um, and uh, and that is a data store uh, and an API uh, specifically designed for this kind of operation. Um, so it uh, it makes things uh, a lot easier. So absolutely, if your team um, is uh, is comfortable with event sourcing um, and uh, and with other uh, patterns and tools that uh, that help out with this immutability, use those tools. Use what you've got. Uh, the the math behind it is all the same. Cool. All right. So snapshots. The date, the modified date in this case, is part of the alternate key. Order by descending to get the uh, the top one, and uh, that gives you your your current version. Um, you can do your concurrency checks even though you're not updating, and this does depend upon having a centralized topology in order for that currency concurrency check to make sense. Um, because if you have a, um, a distributed topology, then your concurrency check is only uh, on the per replica, uh, and uh, then merging the replicas is not going to catch um, concurrency violations. So use a different pattern for those. All right, tombstones. So 
What happens when you want to delete an object? Well, you can't delete things in an immutable database, but here, yeah, let me get back to uh, Fluffy. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and uh, delete Fluffy from the application. Goodbye, Fluffy. So he no longer appears in this query. But if I take a look at the act descriptions, run that, I still see Fluffy. I still see Gabriel Iglesias. I still see all the information about that entity from the past. Um, so why doesn't it show up in the query? Well, that's because I'm doing a query where not exists. Let's take a look at the act queries. So listing all the acts. I want the acts where no act removed. What is this act dot removed? This is a navigation property to the act removed um, uh, table uh, database entity. So um, act removed, that's just the act ID. Uh, so the navigation property to the act and the remove date. So in order to remove something from this query, I insert into the remove table. So I'm inserting a tombstone. There we go. So we're not destroying any data, but we are deleting uh, a record and uh, making sure that it no longer has a visible presence within the application. And so when you run that in SQL, that basically just uh, adds this little where not exists to your um, to your uh, your query, so that is one that you can go ahead and run inside of uh, the uh, the query analyzer. See what the impact is going to be, and you'll see that out of the box that's going to behave uh, pretty nicely. Um, the act removed table is going to have a nice uh, um, key on act ID because Entity Framework creates keys for all or, uh, indexes for all of its foreign keys. Um, if you're designing the database, make sure you create indexes for all your foreign keys, please. They come up all the time. So this is just one of those examples. And uh, and so you're going to um, go ahead and, and when you take a look at the query plan, it's it's pretty cool. It's going to be going through all of the uh, the acts. And then every time it gets to one, it's going to also have a pointer to this act remove table. And it's going to say, all right, this is the next one hour in return. Is it already here? It's not. OK, let me return it and move on to the next. Is it here? Oh, it is. I'm not going to return it. I'm going to just move to the next on both of them. So. It's kind of using that as a nice little journal of what not to return. So pretty cool little query. And that's how you can do tombstones. So that's a nice little simple pattern where the uh, the date um, that you're trying to remove is part of the alternate key. And you do a select where not exists. But what if you delete something by mistake? Mm -mm. Well, all the information is still in the database. Um, we just want to restore that record. Uh, we can restore the record by deleting the remove uh, row, but we don't delete any information in an immutable database. So maybe what we can do is use the same pattern one level down. We're going to insert a child into the, uh, um, the database, a child of the remove table that says, this record is restored. So now it's where not exists, where not exists. So you go a couple of levels down, and that way you're allowed to restore things that were accidentally deleted. And uh, then a lot of people will ask, um, well, what if you want to delete it again? Do you just have another child table, and then another child table, and another child table? Where does it end? Rest assured, it ends right here. You have your your uh, remove table, you have your restore table. That's it. If you want to remove it again, you insert into the remove table another row. And that's why the remove date is part of the alternate key. You can have more than one remove for the same, uh, the same entity. Cool. Uh, now, content addressable storage. This one is one of my favorites. Um, so this is really good for large objects like images. And we want to address those objects. We want to index them according to what they contain and not any 
externally generated ID. What do I mean by that? Let's take a look at, oh, this picture right here of Jeff Foxworthy. If I uh, open this image in a new tab, there we go. Hey, Jeff. So we've got localhost content and then this big old long thing. I don't even know what that is. Oh, goodness. Oh, but it ends in percent %3D, percent %3D. Wait a minute. Hmm, looking that up. Those are equal signs. Oh, that is base64. This is the SHA-512 hash of that image. And that is the ID of that image. That makes it a location independent identifier. No matter where this image is, you compute SHA-512 on it, you're gonna get the same hash. So that is the, um, the identifier that we use. And so if we take a look at that in the code, we will see inside of our uh, content commands, right here, I want to save some content. Here's the binary, here's the content type, PNG, JPEG, GIF. Um, yes, I do pronounce it GIF. Uh, then we are going to compute the SHA-512. We're gonna convert that into base64. Do this in order to make it uh, URL friendly. So URLs don't like slashes and pluses, they mean something else. So change those characters. And now that is the hash, that is the identity of this content. Now we can check to see, do we already have it? If we don't have it, then insert it. Um, and then whether we have it or not, we're going to go ahead and, and return that hash. So we have basically just ensured that it's in the database. So um, you can see that we're saving contents right here in the X controller when we want to save um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the act. So uh, here's the act coming in. So save image contact, our content is coming in from these two places right here. So like here's our create. And so we're going to save the, uh, the image content for our act when we create it. So read that stream in from uh, HTTP, from the, the post that's coming in, um, convert that into a, uh, a memory stream, save that along with the content type. And now we've got our image hash. And so we are going to save the act with that particular image hash. And so that means in the database right here, these image hashes are the base64 encoded hashes of the, uh, the content. And then we can just look it up in the content table by that ID. The really cool thing about that is that if somebody comes in and changes this picture, they, they find a, a better picture of Jeff Fox. I, mean, I don't know how you could, I mean, look at that picture. But suppose you find a, a different picture of Jeff Fox where you wanna use that. Um, we're not replacing the contents at a, a specific ID, we're generating a brand new ID. And so the, uh, the identity captures um, the, um, the snapshot just in and of itself. Um, what that allows you to do is to cache this thing like crazy. So let me go ahead and refresh. And you will see that here I'm getting back my acts. Um, and then uh, within the acts, I'm getting the, uh, the content hash. And so I'm producing this little image tag right here using that content uh, hash. And there is the image tag going out and getting content at that, uh, at that hash. The response that's coming back is, um, if I take a look here at the detail, that um, that is being served out of the disk cache. So what that means is that I'm not actually sending that request to the server. You can see the 200s here are grayed out. Those requests never actually made it to the server. These are requests that were simulated. Uh, they were just handled by the browser itself. And then the browser um, just returned the information that was already in the cache. It was able to do that because we've got this um, response header right here, public max age, that is one year of seconds. 
So we're going to cache this thing for a year. And we, we could cache it longer because we know that that particular image will never change because it's identified by that, uh, that, uh, that hash. So I say that uh, content addressable storage is great for large objects, and it certainly is. That's where it's used uh, an awful lot. But it's not just for large objects. Um, you could actually use the hash of a document, a, a very small document, to represent its identity. Maybe that document is just a little tiny JSON document. Maybe that uh, document is a record in your database, and you've got you know five different columns that uh, if you were to create a, a uh, uh, combined index over those columns, uh, things might uh, not behave very well. So go ahead and hash it, index the hash, use that as your, your alternate key. All right, um, so we've got last call to register for the prize. Please be sure to do that. Um, content addressable storage. Um, we're going to hash the file. We're going to use that hash as the identifier. Here I used it as the primary key. But you could use that as the ID inside of a, um, uh, a, a data store that's that's better suited to that, like uh, um, you know, a content delivery network or a um, uh, Redis or something that's uh, specifically designed for that purpose. Um, you can cache that forever. You know that the content is not going to change because you, once you change the content, you get a new hash. If you want to compute the number of characters necessary to store base64, there's a little formula for it. Um, in this case, we got 88 characters in order to store a SHA-512. But uh, I always keep that one handy because I'm doing this stuff all the time. All right. The, uh, the last little bit that I want to show you um, is commutativity. So we talked about item potency, um, yeah, that, uh, that we can perform an operation twice and get the effect as if we had performed it once. The commutative property means we can perform those operations in a different order and still get the same effect. That comes up when we are talking about um, sharing information between two different systems. So here I've got um, my, uh, my acts. And over here, I've got an Elasticsearch index that's indexing on well, in this case, it's indexing on shows because I'm, I'm going to search for a, a show that I want to go see. So um, all the information about the act and the venue where that show is, uh, is located should all be indexed in here. So that means uh, I should be able to, oh, hi, Jeff. Uh, I should be able to take things that I change here and index them over there. Now, in order to do that, uh, I've got this other application right here, this Festify indexer. I'll go ahead and spin him up. Uh, he's going to start on a different window, isn't he? Or, yep, there he is. So, um, so we started up, <clears throat> and um, and it says, okay, we've seen a whole bunch of messages, so we're indexing an act for Jeff Foxworthy. Uh, you might be a recneck. Here's Fluffy. Uh, so all of the things that we did during the uh, presentation, those went into a queue, and then I brought this up, and it indexed uh, the uh, Elasticsearch uh, repository with that information. So if I refresh now, boom, there we go. Here is Gabriel Iglesias. Oh, wait a minute. I think I might have. Yeah, I found a bug. Wow, that's cool. OK, I'm going to have to fix that. Um, yeah, so uh, I should see Jeff Foxworthy here, um, because Gabriel Iglesias was the one that I deleted um, but, uh, yeah, that is, oh, okay. Gabriel Iglesias is the only, oh, okay. Here's the bug. I don't take something out of the index when I, um, delete the act. Aha. Uh -huh. But, okay, there you go. I'm going to use this as a demonstration of exactly what it is I'm talking about, the commutative property of messages. Um, you want to change this index every time you schedule a show, every time you cancel a show. Every time you change the name of an act, or the name of a venue, or the location, or um, or if you delete an act, so all of these different events could influence this index. What's the order in which you're going to receive those events? Sometimes it's kind of unpredictable. Um, so yeah, isn't that what you want? Never to delete anything uh, from the source of truth? Absolutely. From the search index. 
I want to delete the the show so that somebody can't search on the show, say, hey, Fluffy's playing and, and try to buy tickets. Um, so, so yeah, since this is a projection of my data, I want the projection to just represent current state. Good question. Oh, OK, got it. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we want to um, we want to tolerate all of those different messages and have them affect the um, you know, the the target system in whatever whatever order they arrive, and that's because things can go wrong. Um, when you receive a message, you might not be able to apply the message. Uh, you might need to fix something, and in that case, it's going to move that message into a dead letter queue. It's going to move it out of the way so that other messages can get passed. When you finally fix it and you move that message back into the queue, then um, it's going to be played out of order. Um, even if everything is going just fine, you might have competing consumers. You might have two processes that pick up messages at the same time. And so they might pick up messages one and then two, but then complete two and then one. So they've finished those messages out of order. So even though queues are first in, first out, queues in a distributed system don't always guarantee the order of delivery. So you need to be able to tolerate messages arriving in any order. The way that I have tried to do that is uh, right here. Uh, no, nope, that's the start time. That's part of the data. Right here, I'm capturing the modified date of the act. Here's the modified date of the venue, the modified date of the venue location. Um, so these are the modified dates from the original immutable database. And so I know that when I receive them, if I've already got a modified date that's later than the one that I just received, I can ignore it because I know that these messages arrived out of order. So taking that same kind of logic, you can also think through, OK, if I, um, if I add an act, but then I remove the act, what if I receive the remove before I receive the add? Am I going to get things uh, out of order? Well, in that case, uh, I receive the remove. I don't have Gabriel Iglesias in my uh, index. What can I do? Well, I can just kind of drop that, but then I see the add. OK, here he is. I index him, but he's been removed. I should not have indexed him. So what I really want to do is keep track of, in a separate index in Elasticsearch, all of the things that have been removed. That way, when I receive a message, I can say, nope, that one just arrived out of order. So, so yeah, we uh, need to really reason through um, the order of messages in order to determine whether our event handlers are commutative. So some of the things that can help you to do that um, include the alternate key in the message. So again, never let the primary key uh, leave the database. Store meta information in, at the destination, like the modified dates, like the tombstones. And then compare with that meta information to see if the information you just received is old. Now, again, if you want to take this even uh, deeper, these are a starting point for you to kind of reason through commutativity of messages. Um, if you want to have a, um, <clears throat> a mathematically uh, verifiable way to make sure that your messages are commutative, I go over that in the book. They're called conflict-free replicated data types. They are awesome. OK. So these are the concepts that we just uh, showed in order to demonstrate a, an immutable architecture um, using alternate keys, snapshots, tombstones, the ever awesome content addressable storage, and making sure that your messages are commutative. And <clears throat> we applied all of these using the tools that you already have, that you're already building applications uh, based on. So, um, so you totally can start where you are and start to add immutability to your architectures. And as you do so, you're going to gain uh, some of these benefits. Uh, in order to get uh, even deeper into uh, all of this stuff, um, going deeper into location independence. Um, we can talk about how to um, use immutability in order to analyze your problem space and come up with um, questions about um, causality uh, just from the problem definition. Um, how you can design APIs, design databases, um, how you can secure your systems, all based on this idea of capturing immutable uh, records. And this all kind of leads up to this uh, this vision where now everybody is communicating through this shared immutable state, um, this uh, 
this decision substrate that everybody is publishing uh, into and, and subscribing to. And, uh, and once we reach that nirvana, then uh, we will truly be able to, uh, to collaborate uh, in, a, in a way that we can be secure in, um, yeah, in the, uh, the integrity of our data and, uh, and the safety of, uh, of the, the security that, that, that bounds it. So I hope that you will uh, check it out. Uh, join me on this, uh, on this journey. Uh, please reach out to me on Twitter at uh, Michael L. Perry. And thank you so much for your time.